Thank you so much, Pamela and Mace. Yeah, really happy to be here. I, um, it, it was hard to know what would happen this Wednesday. And um, it's, uh, uh, I'm sure, a variety of feelings for folks and a variety of different experiences. Um, and I'm happy to be here together with all the tenderness, all the openness, all the relief, uh, if that is something you're experiencing or trepidation. So my name is Eve Ekman and I co-teach with Lopan Chandra and we've been making our way through these Lojong slogans. And seriously, you won't hear me say this again. Tonight is my favorite, unparalleled. It is absolutely the favorite. I often say that like, I like this one or it's so perfect or these are so great. Tonight's my favorite. Um, and I have to say, I was like getting nervous that it would be a night when Chandra was teaching. And I, I was really uh, feeling some grasping and clinging around really wanting to delve into this um, slogan with you all. So really delighted to be here um, doing this slogan together tonight. Uh, so this is our 28th slogan, and the slogan is give up all hope of fruition. So we'll make our way there, but that is our basic slogan. And as a spoiler alert, I, I got to hear that slogan and first spoken to me by Pema Chodron, like truly the one of the great masters who's written about these slogans and who has brought them into the 20th and 21st century so beautifully. Um, and yeah, so I, I feel really a deep connection with this slogan. And I also feel it's, it's worthwhile for us tonight to kind of come back um, to the preliminaries as I often am inviting us to do. And also coming back even to the preliminaries of our container here together. We've been so fortunate as a Sangha that I feel on Wednesday nights, we've created a ability to be present with each other in the way that feels good. And we've weathered, <laughs> we've weathered a lot this year, a lot of social, political, cultural, personal events together. And as Mason Pamela mentioned, we are here together completely voluntarily and all completely here to support each other. If it's your first night at the Dharma Collective, you are as valuable and equal a member as anyone else here. And our aspiration and goal is to create a space where folks can really feel as much as possible at ease and as much as possible connected, even in these times. So these are some guidelines that we put together very early on in the pandemic. And yet they are also quintessential teachings, spiritual qualities that help us show up so I'm gonna ease us into my favorite slogan. Like, you know how you try to stretch out when you really like something. So I'm like stretching out every moment as we prepare for this slogan and making sure we enter into the learning of this slogan with as much presence as possible. So in being together, my invitation is that we really call forth this ethic of discipline, of generosity, of patience, and of joyful enthusiasm. And whatever that looks like for you this evening, the discipline always is around how can we guide our body, speech, and mind to be of the utmost non-harming, maybe even kind. So just as though you were putting on this beautiful shining armor of non-harming as we enter here together. And then think of generosity the generosity of being here together, of offering your precious evening. Many of us have quite a lot that we could be doing even without leaving our house. And yet you're here together. And so to give yourself to this experience fully. I was learning about some aspects of neuroscience today I wasn't familiar with around switching of tasks. Everybody knows that it's difficult when we are in front of a computer to not do other things on the computer. But what I was learning is that actually the switching between different tasks is one of the worst things for our attention and our well being. So, if not only for the amazing opportunity to share this space together, but for the rest of your own mind, fully give yourself 
with full generosity to this teaching tonight, to being together in Sangha. And patience, right? We may accidentally um, mute or unmute. We may accidentally find ourselves slipping out of non-harming in our mind, in our thoughts, even, even in our chat, and just having patience with one another, right? That this time is unknowable, uh, what we're all going through and uh, giving ourselves that sense of, okay, a little flexibility. Training in patience is unfortunately probably the most essential spiritual quality and the least kind of appealing. <laughs> like, who wants to train in patience? And yet it's such great training, hearkening back to the days when we were going through the great guide to the Bodhisattva way of life by Shanti Deva. He really invites us to look at patience as just this ultimate training ground. And that we can use the smallest things, like I have this cup of tea, but I actually only have enough for half of a cup of tea. And I could feel some impatience, that like, but I need a whole cup of tea. So even working with that small sense of irritation, that prepares us for the bigger times we need to cut through our own sense of now and aggression. So we can train in our patience tonight. Joyful enthusiasm. This is truly one of my, this one I, I feel as though it comes easily um, for me in this practice. I love being with you guys. I love sharing these slogans. It's, um, yeah, it's such a gift and enriches my understanding so much um, and allows me to be generous and share my time with you all just as you are sharing your time with me. And that joyful enthusiasm when, you know, maybe 15 minutes into the sit, your elbow hurts or something else is aching. And you're like, God, this is just uncomfortable. I mean, why do I even do this? And reminding yourself, wow, I get to do this. How wonderful. I choose oh. to be here. So that's uh, our enthusiasm. So this evening we'll start as we have been doing by beginning with a practice of settling the mind in its natural state. But we're gonna do a bit of a different version tonight. Uh, the version that we'll do tonight is one in which we come upon the mind by actually going through and noticing and highlighting each sense portal and imagining as though we just didn't have that sense portal anymore. So traveling through sight, imagining what if we were no longer sighted, traveling through sound, imagine if we could no longer hear and moment by moment, feeling into what remains when we cannot see, when we cannot hear, what appearances of the mind arise outside of the senses. That, that will be our practice for the night. So I invite you to find a posture that is comfortable. And take your time. If you need to kind of lean to one side and then lean to the other, leaning front and back, really finding where is it that you can have that nice, supple, upright spine. And as we enter this practice, we'll begin with the preliminaries. The preliminaries of Lojong, which help us motivate and connect closely with why do we practice? So I will say each slogan of these preliminaries. And then I invite you to let yourself notice what arises in the mind and heart. Compassionately witness whatever this slogan generates for you without a need to change it or shift it, without a need to make it better or different. So connect to the breath, 
settle the body's speech and mind in their natural states. And consider this first slogan. Maintain an awareness of the preciousness of human life. Be aware of the reality that life ends. Death and impermanence comes for everyone. Recall that whatever you do, large or small, whether virtuous or not, has a result and an impact. Consider that self-focus and self-importance, being caught up in whether we are good or whether we are bad, creates suffering. Obsessing about getting what we want or avoiding what we don't want does not result in happiness. There is no right way or wrong way to feel listening to these slogans. They merely guide us to consider and reflect upon this precious human life. Being able to learn, to connect, to grow. Recognizing that this life is not forever. Everything will change and shift those we love and ourselves. And highlighting this incredible and important wisdom that every action has an impact. Whether that's external in the world or even through our thoughts, our feelings, our inner criticisms, our judgments. And then recognizing that our heartfelt efforts for our own happiness trying to avoid suffering, trying to hold on to what feels good actually doesn't lead to long-standing happiness. And from whatever reflections or insights arise from hearing these words, for some of you many times, it's from this place we develop our aspiration of practice. And consider how to arouse the bodhicitta, our awakened heart. And find words that are meaningful for you. What is the purpose of this practice? Of coming together, of learning, of sharing.
as though you were holding a precious stone. Attend closely to this aspiration. And now beginning our formal practice. Begin settling the mind by noticing all the tactile sensations in the body. Without concepts, without words, simply feeling the body from within the body. When the mind gets caught up by excitation or maybe succumbs to dullness, simply refresh your attention on the sensations in the body. Noticing the areas where the breath is easy to identify, the rise and fall of the belly, the subtle sensations of breath traveling in and out of the nostrils. Gently narrow the focus a bit, settling in to these sensations of the breath traveling in and the breath traveling out, noting especially the temperature of the breath as it travels in and noticing the breath as it travels out. As the breath travels in, notice and connect with this quality of vividness and brightness. And as the breath travels out, connect to a sense of ease and relaxation.
thoughts, of, co of course, are coming and going. Don't try to grasp onto them. Don't try to push them away. Just keep your focus steady on the vividness and the vibrancy of the inhale, the relaxation and ease in the exhale. And we'll shift now, bringing ourselves into a tour of our different senses, exploring them, highlighting them. Begin by gently opening the eyes, noticing shapes and colors and light and movement. In what is seen, let it simply be seen as though you were receiving sight for the very first time. Keeping the gaze panoramic, not focusing on any one thing. And gently closing the eyes. And in so doing, feeling as though you were withdrawing completely from the sense of sight. Noticing what else can be noticed without sight. We move towards the sense portal of hearing and sound. Bring your attention and awareness to what can be heard. As though it were the first time you were hearing, allowing what is heard simply to be heard without preference and without judgment. And while we can't shut our ears the way we can shut our eyes, I invite you to withdraw your attention and awareness from what is heard. And shifting to what remains in the sense portals, bring your attention and awareness fully into the body. Noticing all that can be experienced through the sense portal of touch and sensation, as though it were the first time, with no preference, with no judgment.
And then as though you were given a general anesthetic or had fallen deeply asleep. Withdraw attention and awareness now also from the body. Whatever can be experienced through smell and taste is likely very subtle. Imagining this too, no longer available. Without sight, without sound, without sensation, without smell and taste. Bring the attention and awareness to the great perceptual sense of mind. And instead of noticing shapes and colors as we do with sight or sound and tones as we do with sound, we notice the thoughts arising and dissipating. By settling the mind, we create enough spaciousness for the thoughts to arise, untangle themselves and be naturally released without intervention, without fixing or changing them. As we notice these thoughts, feel or imagine the quality of our naturally still mind, luminous, spacious. Keep relaxing and deeply loosening through the mind. Whatever thought, memory, or image arises, let it arise without interference and without being energized by our attention. Keep settling and deeply relaxing into the mind. Noticing and watching thoughts. Noticing and watching the space between thoughts.
recommit for the final minutes of practice. Remembering your intention and knowing that the practice is a practice, always changing, always evolving. You simply can't do it wrong. And gently and slowly bring some of your, your attention and awareness back into the body. Reawakening sensations. And back into the field of sound. Returning to our hearing. Back into the sense portal of sight, even noticing the subtle light behind our closed eyelids. See if you can feel this entire body, heart, mind, and breath all together through an inhale, all together through an exhale. Thank you for your practice. Anyone have questions or reflections on their practice? So for, for this slogan, I'm gonna start uh, with a, a quote from Pema uh, that she wrote as part of her commentary on specifically this teaching. So again, our slogan is, give up all hope of fruition. And the quote is, one of the most powerful teachings of the Buddhist tradition is that as long as you are wishing for things to change, they never will. As long as you're wanting yourself to get better, you won't. As long as you have an orientation towards the future, you can never just relax into what you already have or already are. 
One of the deepest habitual patterns that we have is to feel that now is not good enough. Does that resonate for anyone here? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's not just of our time. It's not, oh, we have so many things and this capitalist consumer culture, you know, it's, that's the reason. Um, of course, there are many bad things about our contemporary culture, politically, socially, commercially, and otherwise, but this is just a, a feeling that has been around since the time of the Buddha and for sure before then. This, this kind of dissatisfaction fundamentally with this moment as though we were negating anything that was here that was good. And it's interesting, you know, we go back to the past often. And even if things were not really that good or that great, we kind of long for them. And we look toward to the future and we just, God, we hope it's better than right now. And it's just very challenging to be here in this moment. There's just this kind of, you know, sense, even if things are going well for us, that we just hope it's going to get better. Let's just get better. And one thing that uh, Alan Wallace points out in his commentary on these slogans is that this teaching is also really important for us to apply to our aspiration and striving as practitioners. Oh, I'm going to do these Lojong slogans and I'm going to become a real bodhisattva. I'm going to be able to go through anything. Nothing will make me upset anymore. And that that makes us so unsatisfied when our practice is dull or agitated. You know, like we just, we get so tied up that we want to be liberated or become a Buddha. Uh, so this idea of giving up hope of fruition. And you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, last week, I know you guys spoke on the kleshas or these kind of obscuring, destructive, defiling emotions. And these kleshas, right, which are rooted in ignorance, this, this clinging and this aversion, very much attached to fruition. So I, I wanted to be with you all last week, but my, um, my sometimes tricky back went out and I got a real front row seat into aversion. God, I really didn't want it to be that way. I was in pain and it, I mean, fortunately it wasn't that bad as it, as it could be, but just my inability to kind of sit with it and to just accept it. You know, luckily I'm working from home. I don't have to not go to work, right? I have a very warm cat to lie next to as I do my reclined work mode. I have a um, generous partner who helps me um, get food and things I need. And yet so much fixation. When is this gonna get better? How much better, how soon? So just that aversion there. <clears throat> and it just keeps us so bound up, you know, desire of course, so similar. I also had a really interesting view of, uh, of desire and I haven't had that much opportunity to surf uh, with my dear Dharma sister Jenny here because we've had these enormous waves, which has been incredible, but not really fit for us regular people who don't want 50 feet of surf uh, on top of us. And I've just been feeling this desire, like, ooh, I gotta get in the water, I got to. Right now is not okay. When I get in the water, it's gonna be okay. And, you know, it's, it's a relatively wholesome sport. Um, and yet that idea of either wanting to not experience pain or wanting to, you know, get something that will make me feel good was so intense. And so the, the story of how I heard about this slogan for the very first time from Pema, uh, a dear um, a friend and colleague, Yuvini Lubecki, used to run a program called uh, the Dalai Lama Fellows. And they had a wonderful curriculum in which they took people from all over different parts of the globe doing service work and supported them for a whole year. So whether that was building a library in a small village or engaging school children in a class of singing. And a lot of the places where this work was going on, it was really hard. It was really tough, right? Lack of resources, lack of support, 
And the people who became fellows, they were so dedicated. They cared so much. Their heart was fully in it. Their life was one of service. And as we were there um, meeting with the fellows, I, I was fortunate to um, be giving them a training on the same day that Pema Chodron was coming in to speak with them and got to sit and listen as she spoke with them about how to hold their hearts open with compassion. And I raise my hand to ask her a question and I say, how, how do we keep our hearts open and avoid burnout when we care so deeply, it matters to us so much. And she, um, she's really um, just unbelievably powerful in this tiny little frame. <laughs> she just was really, uh, yeah, quite startling to be near her having read so many of her books and, and feel as though she um, has helped me through so many things. Um, it was really, felt very fortunate. <clears throat> and she said, well, this probably won't make any sense at first, but like sit with it. She said, the only hope to really overcome or get through burnout is to give up all hope of fruition. She said, don't give up hope, but give up hope that you have any idea or any ambition about how it will turn out. And I think it's, it's really, uh, it has been like literally invaluable to me. Um, it's a mantra that I use for myself when I'm getting a little bit too caught up and a little bit upset and a little bit agitated, it kind of relates back to that, that very similar or um, simple theme of last week of, of letting go. But I think when we think of letting go, it's like an on off switch. Either I care and I'm doing everything I can in the world and I become exhausted and then I have to turn off in which I don't do anything. And I'm you know cuddled up with my coconut bliss uh, binge watching The Mandalorian, right? Or some other um, programming. And this idea here is that we actually stay engaged. We don't remove ourselves from engagement, but we in some ways loosen an idea of how it's gonna turn out, what it will look like. It's so tough, it's so tough. This one actually is pointing directly at our striving. And we can have very healthy striving. Uh, two weeks ago, I remember someone, um, a conversation that comes up a lot, which is these practices, they are all pretty nice and good, but what about helping people? When do we get to the helping people, right? And um, my quest, my answer, first answer, which was totally unsatisfying, but luckily Lopan Chodra, Ch Chandra um, followed up. Mine was, they're not separate, right? The helping ourself and the helping other. But I also think the way that we learn to take care of ourselves is also the way that we learn to take care of others. And so this idea of how can we do so without this grasping, I'm going to do this with all my heart so that I can change the way things are. Things are terrible the way they are. They have to be different. That energy can be wholesome. It really can be supportive of us. It can motivate us. It can help us move forward. But also, my God, it can drain us. And it inadvertently kind of gets us caught up in this egoic need to know how it's going to be. We have to change things. This world is full of suffering, a lot of it unnecessary. There's no question. And each one of us here, <clears throat> I hope, continues to find our way to do so in whatever way is meaningful for us. And yet, how do we balance this spiritual path, which is one of self-cultivation with this part and requisite of the spiritual path, which is for all beings? It's hard. I think, I, I don't know, I would like to take a poll, but I don't really know how to do that on uh, Zoom at this moment of how many people tend towards apathy and how many people tend towards burnout. Or maybe we just go back and forth. It's, you know, it, it's really, it's a real tough one. Um, before I, I move on, I'd be, I'd be curious, what are, what 
what are folks' thoughts on this, giving up all hope of fruition? It may not be new for some of you, but I think it can be new each time we hear it. I will say that when that becomes your lens, it can feel a bit as though we don't know how to describe our motivation. Like when I was listening to um, <clears throat> our new president this morning um, and listening to his speech, which in many ways was uh, meaningful and moving and, and with many compassionate um, aspirations, there was a lot of fruition in there. This is not good. This other thing will be good and better. That was terrible and we're headed towards what's good, right? And I, gosh, I really hope so. But we get so bound up in that desire and they can just really leave us feeling kind of agitated until that time comes. But a speech, you know, in which he started off by saying, fellow Americans, give up all hope of fruition. Um, kind of unlikely, kind of unlikely. Doesn't really get you elected. It's a little bit too much nuance, but it, you know, it, it is, I mean, at least I'll speak for me, first person investigation, it has been very helpful. It has been very helpful. Any thoughts or questions on this slogan? from Jason. When I first heard this, I didn't get it at all. I was still clinging to hope. I like hope. But now I'm starting to get what it feels like to be totally present. And in the present, we are already fulfilled. That's what I've learned so far. Wow. Thank you, Jason. I'm so beautiful. That's right. The fruition piece is its future. It's definitely not here. Um, you have a question yeah. and a comment. Um, my question is very simple. Is if you can share the um, September Children quote that you shared at the beginning. Yes. That'd be fantastic. Um, and I really appreciate this topic so much and this, um, this slogan so much. I feel like it's been my, yeah, my koan for my entire sort of relationship with Buddhism. Um, and one thing that was really powerful a little while ago um, learning about the different, like, like the 12, like there's a cycle of 12 codependent originations. Maybe that's, yeah, I don't know. And the very first one is ignorance. And then everything else yeah. goes from that. And for me, that was very much this, like, if, if we act from this place of fruition, then everything else kind of spins out of control. But if you cut it from the root, then you can still do everything else, but you're not, you, that's how, yeah, isn't that like, that's how you avoid turning the wheel of karma or whatever? I don't know exactly what it is, but. It's exactly right. Ignorance is like the very, it's the root, right? And if um, we cut it or transform it, depending on your vehicle, um, yeah, we free ourselves from the suffering. And, you know, I think you're, um, I agree that we could look at this aspiration for fruition as ignorance and not ignorance in a like um ignorance has such a bad connotation uh in the english language we could we could just call it <clears throat> you know not knowing right and and as i was saying this this hope this idea that things will get better it's so natural right it, it is probably pre-selected for our survival Evolutionary psychology would most likely say that a desire to improve is allows, has allowed all of our ancestors up until this moment to survive. If we were like, oh, this looks good. This is pretty good. We'll stay here. Um, that wouldn't have led to um, our ability to kind of move throughout different lands and continents and discover whatever it was that um, optimized and helped us survive as, as tribes and then villages and then societies and then cultures. And so I, I think it's a really tough one to work against. Um, fruition is, is how we're oriented. Um, and I, I think that um, 
eliminating ignorance is a really high bar. But I've been really enjoying, you know, loosening. Um, I, I think that that verb is, is really accurate, right? It's part of what we do in our mind when we do these practices of settling the mind is we loosen, right? We don't eradicate, we don't deny, we loosen. Um, and so having a little bit of that loosening and, <clears throat> you know, the simple examples of just like catching it right there, right? Catching it when we have that fru fruitive, I don't know if you'd say it that way, that fruition-based desire, that fruition based aversion. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear it's been um, a useful guide also for you on the journey. Hey, I'm Joseph, everybody. It's good to see everybody. Uh, when we talk about fru fruition, are we just talking about not having expectations? Very good that, question. Is that, is that basically what we're just doing? That's yeah. the word I would use, expectation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think fruition, you know, is like how it, it literally fruits, right? So let's say we are, um, you know, we're a farmer. That's an easy one. And we plant a seed and then we have an expectation of that seed giving some kind of fruit to us, right? Um, and, and we're like leading and leaning towards the fruit of what we do. Uh, but that could also be the same case if you are, um, you know, working in as a lawyer and you take on a case and with, with your client, you can work very hard for them. You realize they were wrongly accused. You want to do your best. But if you're focused on getting them, you know, <clears throat> to not be convicted, if that is your entire goal, you'll most likely um, set yourself up for being upset very often. And so that's why, you know, Pema was saying that this give up all hope of fruition could work also in healthcare. Because for the majority of healthcare professionals, they're, they care so much and they're really in it for fruition. They want their patients to be healthy and live. They don't have total control over that. Not only do they not have control over, you know, the basic resources these patients have available, but right, humans, we do suffer and, and we do die. <clears throat> and so with fruition, it's definitely expectation, but it's kind of the, it's like we are focusing on the outcome. Does that make sense? Yeah. Joseph, is that, is that clear? Similar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I see it a little, I see it on a little deeper level, level now. Cool. You know, as far as uh, fruition being like a little bit, I don't know the word to use, fruition is a little deeper than expectation. Mm -hmm. Expectation is more limiting, I think. I think it's, it leads to our fruition, yeah. Yeah, whereas fruition, you know, is a little, a little deeper than just having a certain expectation. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. that makes sense. I'm learning here. That's why I show up. I'm so glad. You are yeah. welcome. <laughs> Thank you for so, the question. But yeah, I learn something every week. If this is great, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I think, <clears throat> I think expectation. You know, it's tough. A lot of these qualities, there's something in them that's very good, right? Ambition and striving. Again, this can be really wholesome, really supportive. It really helps. It helps us get through. It helps us go through periods of time that are hard because we know that on the other end, it's a goal that matters to us, right? So that's, that's wholesome striving and wholesome ambition. But I think we just, we can find ourselves out of check into afflictive ambition where we're losing a sense of what really matters, which is often getting there, right? So in Buddhism, you often hear teachers talk about ground, path, and fruition as phases of practice. And though that's not exactly what's being talked about in this slogan, it's interesting to think, well, the ground and the path, they really matter. Like getting the foundational ground of our heart and mind being open and walking a path that is one of dig dignity, right? One in which we are really actually putting one foot in front of the other, kind of imbued with the qualities, the virtues that matter. That's the very, maybe 
overly used cliche way of saying it would be the journey is the destination, right? So focusing less on what happens when we get there and how it will come out. And honestly, it's, it's, it's self-preservation to do so. Um, I see a, a comment here from Sally. I work every day within the social justice sphere. Thank you for your work in the environmental justice movement and spiritual practices are so key in keeping organizers from burning out and remember our stake in the work connected deeply with our hearts and that is what truly sustains us. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's impressive to have the spiritual lens on social justice work, especially. Um, I think it's, it's pretty hard to do so without some, um, some of that deep inner strength and resource. You think of Dr. King who had his commemorative day on Monday. And, you know, I just, <laughs> hard to imagine Dr. King and his colleagues going through it all without their faith you know, without their deep sangha and spiritual connection with others. Um, that's a real sense of um, doing good for the sake of, of good. Um, yeah, yeah, and you know, the giving up all hope of fruition, it also can lead to that sense of uh, maybe needing to be a martyr. Just doing it and nothing happens, it's okay. And that's also not what we mean. We want things to change. We want things to improve. We want our efforts to have efficacy and yet we don't get bound up with that. This also works, someone said this works for raising a teenager. Absolutely, absolutely. It works for all of our relationships. We are generous and kind and caring, but if we do so with that expectation of what that should lead to, we might be disappointed. We might really feel it. I think what's, uh, what's interesting about this slogan is it really puts us on this kind of nice edge between apathy and despair, which is the place we have to live, right? We can't live in apathy, which is, well, whatever happens in the world doesn't really matter to me. Ignorance is bliss. I'm just gonna kind of keep here to my little safe corner or the despair, opening your heart to the suffering of this world and actually realizing that we can't do everything we want to do about it, it's profoundly heartbreaking. And one of the ways that we kind of, I'd say, grow up with this slogan is realizing actually being with the suffering of the world, compassionately witnessing is doing something. So there has been quite a bit of research on <clears throat> the feelings of empathic distress and overwhelm, often leading to burnout. I care, it's, I can't believe this is happening. It's too much for me. This is, I can't do enough. And when people feel helpless, like they can't do anything, they're more likely to feel overwhelmed. If you see someone suffering and you can do something, actually, that feeling of distress is relieved greatly and might even become a feeling of altruistic joy. But when we experience or witness that distress and we, we can't, what we say, do anything, we can't actively do anything, it feels so overwhelming. And so uh, Venerable Tenzin Choki, who many of you know, often shares this teaching on compassionate witnessing and that that is actually highly efficacious. It's doing something. That when we compassionately witness the suffering of others and of this world, it's not being apathetic, but it's not being in despair. And that it's actually the stance of the warrior. Very powerful. I see a question. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Thank you. I, I uh, want to ask a question and see what you think of this. Um, I need to take, uh, make a decision in a week 
about something that will entail uh, something very hard for me to, to do. It's a five week stay in the hospital. And the outcome of that, what they tell me is that it can be a cure for my, for, for my illness, a, a, a natural cure. But the outcome, who knows what, what it will be. They say there's a big chance, but they, they, really, they, they can't swear on it. And, and I'm having a lot of trouble making up my mind to do this because there's a part of me that I, don't, I, I waver because I don't know if I have the strength, the inner strength to go through mm -hmm. five weeks cooped up in a room and mm -hmm. not being able to breathe fresh air and you know, walk and all of that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's a part of me that I, I what, what should I do, I think? Um, should I think I'm going to get cured? I'll go through mm -hmm. this because I'm going to get cured. And what if I don't get cured? So, um, it, it, which, can, which can be the outcome. Should I still go through it? So, when you are talk about fruition here, how, how should I think about this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so happy to see you, first of all. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you for sharing this um, incredibly important aspect of how do we bring this to our life? Right? How do we bring this to our real decisions on the ground? Um, and I think, you know, <laughs> it's impossible in some ways for us as humans, we have very poor capacity for what's called prospective forecasting. How will I feel even in a week? We're terrible. We're terrible at imagining how we'll feel. And we're even worse when it comes to big decisions, actually. If I don't get this thing, I'm gonna, there's no way I'll survive. If I do get this thing, I'm gonna be so happy. Actually, it's not accurate. The way we even imagine how we feel is not accurate. So kind of almost keeping in mind that our projected version of reality is profoundly distorted. And that what we can really, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> the best we can really do is consider like, what could I do tomorrow or what is it like in this present moment uh, and how can I maybe imagine how this present moment will be like that next moment and you know it's true hospitals are really hard places really hard places especially receiving intensive treatment um, and I will reflect that I have heard you share before how you were able to make receiving treatment into a practice you know, so I think our best indicators are not actually our prospective imaginings of this is how it will be, is, is more how have I before? You know, I really think there's wisdom there because we, we underestimate, I think, our resilience. And it's, it's these, these studies and, and even in our own kind of narrative reimagining of our life, we see that these challenging times, oh my God, we did pretty good you know we really did and I of course you know having the practices is invaluable and it's I'm I will <clears throat> just say that some of the most inspiring um, experiences I've ever had uh, with meditation teachers are those who've gone through extreme challenges right or just practitioners and that you know it's not that there's there's no they don't let any good suffering go to waste. Mm -hmm. They really, really bring it, right? And it's not easy, but it's not futile. It's not like, oh, I got through that. I went through this hard, hard thing and now I'm done. Whew, I hope it never happens. If they go through this hard thing and it's like that hardness that creates the diamond, right? It is truly just the proving ground of their compassion. So that would be my hope for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's a beautiful quote by Chogyam Trimpa. 
actually about this kind of opening up that when we give up hope of fruition, paradoxically, we become so courageous. Because we're willing to be with what actually is happening, you know, we're willing to be with it. And the way that Chagam Trumpa, he describes courage. He often says, you know, fear, fearlessness is not the absence of fear. And in this quote, he says, when tenderness tinged by sadness touches our heart, we know that we are in contact with reality. We feel it. That contact is genuine, fresh, and raw. That sensitivity is the basic experience of warriorship. And it is the key to developing fearlessness. I just love that. Just the warriorship of being with our fear. He also talks about just the incredible beauty of our grief, that there's a joy and a sadness together. Because when we give up hope of fruition, we have to open up to grief. That we can't change it, fix it, make it better. We can still, again, compassionately witness and be with. That open heart, that raw heart, that warriorship heart. Very tender. I just love how much he, Chogyam especially uses this word tender. Many of you, you know, but Chogyam Trumpa is Pema Chodron's teacher. So it feels like you're kind of um, getting this source source there. And um, he talks about just the tender heart of the warrior and that you let the world tickle your heart. And you open it up completely. Any other questions or reflections before we move into our Tonglen for the evening? I see a, a comment I missed before, uh, which says, every time I think about not having a sense, I thought to myself, well, at least I still have these other senses. It would be too hard to lose any of my senses and I would love to be able to renounce and accept losses. Yes, um, there are so many beautiful practices that invite us to really imagine the whole process of, of loss and dying and even decay on the charnel ground. This one is really to kind of help us pull in, into the mind. Because we really, we, we, God, we have such an amazing mind and yet often we really defer to these other ways of experiencing the world. We're, we're really, we're seeing everything and we're feeling and we're listening and we aren't as tuned into this just incredible perceptual portal that our mind offers. So it's a little bit of that, um, that approach. I see, I see, oh yeah, Claudia, yeah. Um, I kind of have a question. I don't know how to explain it necessarily. When we're talking about the slogan um, and you're saying we shouldn't give up hope, but um, not we should not expect a certain outcome but what if uh you're striving for a cause or something and all of a sudden you realize that it's kind of like trying to plant a rose in cement then what it's like yeah changing your path yes. having different goals uh, and still be open to the outcome? Yes, that sounds like wise discernment to me, 
right? So if, if what you've been doing and efforting towards, you realize actually this is not the best use of my energy and my attention. You know, you don't deny or reject or negate, but you're really kind of wisely moving on. Is that, is that what you're meaning or asking about? Yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess the idea is, uh, then I thought, well, then you, you have different goals, but maybe it's still, I mean, having different goals, but still being open to the outcome, huh? Yeah, we can absolutely shift, you know, um, how we're directing our attention. But again, the, the key here is to not get too hung up on what we think it needs to be. But I also, you know, I, I do think, and, and Pema talks about this, is sometimes as practitioners, we can give ourselves too much to something that is actually not ours to do, hmm. right? And, you know, with the compassionate heart, there can be a little bit of that uh, risk. So just applying that discernment, like, is this actually where I should be? Hmm. Is this mine to do? And when I say, is this mine to do, like, is, can I make an impact that's of benefit? Is it the right time? Um, is, you know, is there, is there the right place for me? So I think that's a, it's, and we're always, you know, examining how much of my, um, you know, egoic um, structure is tied up in this. It's really hard to let go of something we've been working on, whether it's a relationship or a job. Um, and we sometimes get locked in because it's like this aversion to loss as opposed to what's really, wholesome for us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I see that, um, is it Key or is it Kai? It's Key. Key. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I just, uh, I just, I do really like this slogan. Um, it, it, feels really, uh, I think it's going to be my new mantra. It feels really, and it's, it's so apropos for these times. Um, it feels that it's very liberating. Yeah, actually, to give up fruition, super liberating. Um, yeah, st still saying, you know, trying to be as let go of obscurations and be as true to the nature of it, letting go of uh, the outcome. Because some of that stuff seems really larger than life, and it's like you know, I'm some of these things. Who knows? We may see in our my lifetime or not, you know. So uh, it is freeing to give up. Um, yeah, that striving for the the fruition. So thank you for sharing that today. Oh, and doing yeah. the that today. Yeah, thank you for the reflection. I think it also what you're saying reminds me that. We can still be surprised and delighted by a nice outcome. We don't have to like be bummed if something good happens, right? That's, no, not, no. <laughs> that's not part of the slogan, um, no, no. <laughs> thankfully, right? So it's like, uh, I don't expect it to be good, but if it is like, wonderful, like full heart rejoicing. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I think, you know, he always, talks about being open to compassion. And it's like, I almost forget, he keeps saying open to compassion, not just feel compassion and act, but this openness to compassion. And that is, right, that's, that's our ability to accept and be open with things as they're coming, um, which I really appreciate. So in, in, this, in this teaching of the Lojong, right, we're balancing here these qualities of developing and training the mind, putting our attention towards noticing the mind. And then also all the time we have to be composting, composting the difficult, heavy, often um, emotional content of our everyday life. And I'll say since the last time we were together <laughs> um, in some, I've been, well, I'll tell you guys some, something exciting. I'm writing a book, which is uh, pretty exciting six chapters in and kind of just all over it. And uh, as such, I'm, I've been looking up a lot of material. And one thing I realized is in the literature on sleep, 
which hopefully will be good news for all of you who struggle with sleep, that this Tonglen practice is great. Not that they've studied Tonglen, I, I hope they get there um, in order to sleep, but when they look at the, when I look at the interventions which are done to help people sleep, a lot of it has to do with metabolizing the emotional tone of our day. What happened today? How did it feel? And without getting kind of caught up in, uh, I said this to this person and they said this back to me and then we did this and it, but just the, that feeling of the body and taking it in as we will with Tonglen and then extending it out with a heartfelt wish of care and love. And the way that the practice is taught in, in these clinical studies is you know, just writing it down. And I was so delighted because I was like, wow, we can do better than that. We can meditate on it. People sleep even better that way. So we're going to do a Tonglen practice on our day. To keep us right here in this day, metabolizing whatever has arisen today for us. So that is what we will do. So please um, find your posture of ease and vividness. Emphasizing especially that gentleness that we can aim for and how we are with our body, with our heart, with our mind. I'm taking just a couple moments to come home into the body and the breath. You're noticing sensations in the body, especially at the heart center. Maybe feelings or emotions that have been the residue from the day or maybe what has been evoked in our time here together. Tuning in to the sensations at the heart. And with curiosity and enthusiasm, noticing them closely. Are they swirling? Are they undulating? Is there heaviness or lightness? Is there a shape? I'm taking a couple moments to notice whatever is here and feel or imagine as though we could make as much space for these feelings as was needed. And generate a heartfelt aspiration of caring for our own experience in this moment. opening our heart to our own heart. Feeling the strength and uprightness of the spine as we feel the softness and the opening through the chest. And as we inhale, we draw in whatever is here in the heart that wants to be transformed and made light. And as we exhale, we extend out a wish of care, of safety, of ease. Inhale, drawing in, opening our heart to our heart. Exhale, may I feel belonging, may I know safety. May I be at ease. And continuing to ventilate the heart for a couple more breaths.
And going back in time, the beginning of this day, whenever you first opened your eyes, maybe recalling the quality of light or darkness in the room. And the first thoughts or sensations or feelings. And without a lot of elaboration, a lot of talking, just noticing the quality of the heart and the mind in the morning and gently allowing yourself to move through the day, but especially noticing times that were somewhat hard or challenging, areas where you felt contracted, times when there was agitation or unrest. All these maybe small or even sometimes large episodes of difficulty of challenge and recalling them with this utmost care, this tender open heart. Care for each of these small or large concerns and challenges as though they were the most important thing you could care for. as though your own challenges and suffering truly matter. A couple more moments, just reflecting on some of the challenges or difficulties of the day with this deep caring. And again, allowing your heart to open to itself. And as we inhale, drawing in this heartfelt aspiration. May my heart know ease. May my heart feel safe. May my heart experience belonging. Inhale, drawing in with this willingness to see and touch into what's hard. And exhale, extending out with this aspiration. This aspiration without fruition. <laughs> May I wish for myself belonging and safety, peace and ease. And then taking a moment to include all beings on this call, all beings on this planet, on the very planet herself. Dedicating this intentional time we spend with one another, that all beings on this planet <clears throat> and galaxies beyond May all of us have an opportunity to care for our own suffering, to be of service to one another, to truly find freedom. Great to be with you all.